Let's talk about what the Fed is doing right now and what you would have done. You would have stopped raising rates quite a bit sooner, correct? Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Becky. I, 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 I would have. I, I continue to worry about risks, and I think there's downside risk to uh, on the growth side from what's going on around the world, and there's downside risk uh, to inflation uh, that, again, partly from around the world, but just internally, we just have not seen that that strong inflation push that I would like to have seen. So I, I would have, I would have uh, been much more cautious about raising rates in 2018 than the Fed was. The Fed sounds like, for now at least, it's probably going to be on pause, although it does sound like it will continue to shrink the balance sheet. Um, is that the right move? Yeah, so I'm not quite sure why they're shrinking the balance sheet. Um, you know, I think they're going to need a big balance sheet the next time a recession comes. So, uh, and, and as the economy grows, you're going to want that balance sheet to grow uh, in lockstep in order to have the, the tools you want for, for when the next recession comes. So I, I'm not sure why they're shrinking the balance sheet. I like the, uh, frankly, I like the autopilot part of it, but I'm not sure why they're, why they're shrinking it. I, I guess the point I, was that these were emergency measures, and if we've moved out of emergency period of time, maybe you want to get back to some semblance of normalcy? Yeah, I, I, yeah, there is, I, I, you know, when I, back when I was in the FOMC, we talked a lot about trying to get back to 2005 and 2006. I think we have to recognize the world is a, is a different place. It's a world where interest rates are going to be low, uh, looks like, for a long time to come. And it looks like it's a place where you're going to need your balance sheet tools if there's ever a recession. So you might as well be ready for that now uh, by, by, by keeping, I think, a, a big balance sheet. You know, part of the argument that's been out there, and, and again, I won't necessarily agree with any of this, but part of the argument that's been out there is you've got to raise rates so that you have a little bit of dry powder the next time the economy comes down. Next time there's a, a recession, what is the Fed left to do if we've already employed all these emergency measures and left them out there uh, continually? You know, if you're worried about the patient getting sick, it's, uh, you don't, you want to keep it, keep the patient as healthy as possible. And so the dry powder argument is basically the idea is that if we, you're relying on the changes in, in the position of your tools, you know, lowering rates is what matters, or um, raising the balance sheet what matters. Um, the vision that most economists have is actually it's not the change, but rather the position of the tools that matters. And so you want to you keep rates low if you're worried about the patient <coughs> ever getting sick. You want to keep the balance sheet big if you're worried about the, the patient ever getting sick. Diana, can we talk about the cost of money and what money ought to cost. Um, we, we've got a, a, what do you call it, a 2.4% uh, uh, funds rate right now, a 2% inflation rate, which means that real money costs 0.4%. Is that normal or should there not be some movement back towards, you know, th there's a 300 year history of the real cost of money and it's certainly higher than 0.4% for overnight money. <laughs> No, that's correct. Um, but I, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not very good at telling you things like that. Um, I, I just, I think we have to, as a policymaker, um, and the way I think about the, these kinds of questions is through the lens of policy. You just have to track where the economy is taking us. You know, if you look at the estimates of the natural real rate of interest that Lawback and Williams have done, those follow a random walk, and what that means is they can go up and they can go down, and uh, it's. There's a lot of variation, and if you look over the next 10 years of where we might we might end up with the, the, the real real rate of natural real rate of interest, it might be very low, uh, even lower than it is today, or it might be higher. Um, so I don't think we can think of and the main thing with the random walk means you can't look back at the past and say, okay, huh. we're going to go back to where we were. So should the Fed just then hold tight until we get the inflation that you were expecting, and and sort of say, hey, we're there now as long as inflation isn't reacting? I would love the Fed to be more uh, responsive to the data. And what I mean by that is it's not uh, – I, I think announcing a pause right now is not really what I would like to see them do. I'd rather have them say rates can go up, rates can go down. We're going to be watching economic conditions. Uh, when, when Powell stands up before uh, uh, the press in, in – not in January, but in March – it could be we'll have decided to bring rates up or bring rates down. I want a more flexible Fed than we've seen uh, in the past, really the past 15 years. Can I give him a grade in communications? You may. 
I've given him an A in communications. All right, can I do that? <laughs> because of what he said or because you agree with what he said? Because I think that to say you're data dependent means you're data dependent. So don't make any, don't but make any, Mariana, they don't I, know their, their I, models the, are, the, are The terrible. problem, Mariana, is what data are they dependent on? That's where so much of the, the questions come down. Are we dependent on key numbers that you get from different departments of the government? Are you dependent on what the tenure does, what other markets do? What data should they be following? You got it. So the, 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 the great thing about being a monetary policymaker is that the data you've got, uh, you've got, you get to filter all the data down to two variables, um, pretty much, employment and inflation. Right. And you want to track everything through your forecast for those, for those variables. And yes, those forecasts have error. And, and, and uh, everyone knows that those have error. But that, you do the best job you can in terms of forecasting on inflation and, and employment. Um, and then you, you go on the basis of those two variables. If inflation looks low, you, you want to keep, uh, you want to you, you want to add a combination. If inflation looks high, you want to take a combination out. And you want to be responsive to the things that are going to be changing your forecast. But low very unemployment well. shouldn't cause you, it's, uh oh, unemployment is very low. I've got to raise rates. That's, the, that, that's not part of the mandate. You're supposed to be trying to get rates to zero if you can't unemployment. I, as long as, no, the, the, I, I, I don't think that the mandate uh, <laughs> says uh, don't lower unemployment. Um, I think the mandate says uh, don't have inflation be too high. Right. And so as well, long infl as inflation remains low, I see no uh, reason to be worrying uh, about the level of accommodation, uh, right. having right. monetary policy being too easy. I don't see that at all.